Good morning, and thank you for joining our special webinar series from Spec Innovations, How to MBSC. We're going through the entire life cycle in this series. Last time we showed you how to develop and simulate models, and today we're gonna to talk about using Enaslate for configuration management. My name is Elizabeth Steiner, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. First, let's go over some housekeeping. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions and we will get them answered in the question and answer part of the webinar. You can also interact with us on LinkedIn through our Enaslate user group or through Twitter using the handle at Enaslate. The webinar is being recorded and we will make it available to you after the live presentation, so be sure to keep an eye out for it in your inbox. Now I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Steve Dam. Dr. Dam is the president and founder of Spec Innovations, as well as one of our training instructors. He has been involved with research, experiments, operations analysis, software development, systems engineering, and training for more than 40 years. He has also received an expert systems engineering professional certification from INCOSI. He currently is applying systems engineering techniques to various DOD, DOE, and commercial projects. Feel free to send Dr. Dam any questions through this webinar using the questions panel on the right. And now I'll hand over the controls to Dr. Dam and we will get started. Thanks, Elizabeth, appreciate it. So uh, today I'm going to jump right into what we're going to learn and we'll do a few slides as usual, but then we'll spend a lot of our time in the tool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some key configuration management processes and, and, and particularly uh, want to talk about, we will talk about how InnoSlate supports those processes. Uh, and that's, that'll be the next step, walking through those different aspects of the life cycle and particularly how we apply uh, configuration management and InnoSlate across that. So starting off, uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with this uh, diagram. This is right out of the NASA handbook. Um, the the uh, configuration management is consisting of the configuration planning and management, configuration identification, uh, change management, status accounting, and of course verification. Uh, so the thing is, you have to we have to continually to develop and and that and update the, the configuration management plan. It's not a one-time thing. A lot of people will treat it that way, but really, over time, uh, you're you're looking at things, you're learning, and you're making adjustments to the plan. So it's always worthwhile to keep that as a living document. Um, then, of course, that identification, and you know, it's it's what items do you need to keep under configuration control and why? Because it's expensive, right? It's it's hard to track this stuff, and it takes time and energy, and that that end up translating into dollars. So you want to be very judicious and choosing your configuration items. Of course, defining your change management process is very important. Uh, do, are you gonna do formal boards? Uh, is, is there some other way you're gonna deal with change? Uh, uh, so, you know, more, more agile way of may of dealing with change management. So these are the kinds of things you wanna think about as you're doing your change management processes. And of course, you can model those processes as well, and probably should, to make sure that they are executable. Uh, and of course, then verification. How do we make sure that it's going to work? And it's going to be through that process. And again, so often historically, we've done this through audits, and uh, and and particularly those that that's kind of spot checks. Um, I think Deming told us back in the 50s, <laughs> you have to build in quality. You can't you can't inspect it in. And that's that's a key part of this. Our, our whole thought process is how do we help you build that into the process? And same thing with configuration management, and and is part of that. So again, these are the elements of a success for successful implementation of configuration management in our project. Uh, of course, the NASA also has some very interesting configuration management processes, and of course, uh, you know this is this is particularly. Uh, NASA's definition, uh, you know, it, it's a management discipline. Uh, you know, it's funny because because I see that word management discipline and I think, well, but, but but it's also a systems engineering discipline, and of course it is. It's again it's that overlap between systems engineering and program management that's, that's so fundamental. Um, so so we, we're working together with the program management to 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 help uh, you know conduct this this uh, configuration management project. Um, and of course, the uh, product lifecycle, you know, make it visible again, so you can see what's going on all the way through the life cycle. And that's where that's where having a tool like InnoSlate help, can really help you. 
Um, <laughs> of course, we know what happens with improper configuration management. <laughs> you have lots of problems, and it, it ends up you get things are lost, and, and, you, and you, you're, you find your, your program in deep trouble if you really don't have a very strong CM process. Um, of course, uh, the INCOSI has a definition as well, by the way, so that's you got kind of the managerial kind of flavor from them, uh, and here you're getting more of the systems engineering flavor. So uh, it's identifying and formalizing the functional and physical characteristics of, of a system, you know, the configuration item, okay, discrete points. So again, it's, and of course, it's a heavy focus on, on this idea of baselining, baseline, baseline, baseline. In other words, at some point in time, you say, I'm going to stop and say this is this is my configuration at this point in time, and then you're going to make changes to it, <laughs> and there'll be a later baseline. And of course, you're used to this in software, right? It's called versioning. We have different versions of the software. Well, of course, we baseline all kinds of things in an actual in a complete systems development, uh, not just the software and not just documents. Uh, again, most people think of these baselines this way. This again is from the NASA uh, side of things. Again, they're open source, and so it's easy, one of the easiest places and one of the most consistent people in terms of configuration management. So that's why I chose them. Uh, you find this other organizations have other processes and procedures and, and thoughts. But the types of baselines they're looking at, like things like the functional baseline, that's your higher level uh, system and segment level specifications. Uh, then your allocated baseline, where you're now starting to say, okay, well, what's my physical implementation of the system, and how is that going to work? And then, of course, ultimately an an end product baseline as well. And of course, you might come up with other ones in between and things like that. But again, uh, this can start getting kind of tedious. Uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, it's it's you, you feel like you're just doing bookkeeping. Uh, and you didn't get into engineering to be an accountant. <laughs> so how, how do I keep it from doing that, from, from being that burdensome? And this is, again, where the tools can help to implement the process or not. They can get in the way. So you have to be careful, again, how you apply the tool and where you use it uh, to use it most effectively. Again, each organization will define their own processes. This happens to be spec innovations process here on the right. Uh, it's one I've used for many, many decades uh, here at, at Spec Innovations. Um, I think we're in our 25th year, <laughs> so pretty close. Uh, so anyway, so the, uh, I'm sorry, almost 30 years right now, isn't it? Wow, the time flies. Anyway, so uh, you, you have these different things. You see it has many of the same elements you saw on the very first diagram with the process steps. And here, though, I focus a lot on the input outputs and particularly this idea of a system engineering knowledge base. So this concept I've had actually for many years and using many tools uh, is not an InnoSlate specific concept at all. Uh, so you can apply it with literally any tool. But, uh, but the, the idea is that you were tracking and using this database system to, to help you uh, keep the relationships between the information together and that's a lot of what you're managing in change management. So it's not just, again, hardware, software, things like that. It's the whole set of information. If you think about it, the model you're building in that in that uh, MBSE tool is, is something that gets completely under configuration. It's all that data. It's the data that's important, and that is what you're configuring in reality. So, so that's, that's a key part of the, the thought process of, that we take to it and making sure we have that. And then we can use that database to help us generate the results and the products and the, the ability to, that people need to, to understand uh, what, where you are in the configuration. Uh, of course, important for that is the ability to ingest that information. Can I, can I bring the information into the tool in a way that I can then now uh, configuration, configure it, uh, track it, uh, look for changes, do change management, change control, all those kinds of things are things I'm looking for in the tool. Of course, you can use it to conduct analyses and create those necessary reports. And that's the key part of that, again, of my thing is the output. What am I producing for the, for the, uh, for the process? Okay. So let's get into talking a little bit more about InnoSlate and what can InnoSlate do. 
And of course, um, you all are probably familiar at this point with all the things we do through the life cycle. Um, this is actually still even a subset of what we do. Um, so the question is, where does configuration management fit into the system's life cycle? Well, the answer is everywhere. <laughs> it's actually important all the way through, as many of the other management disciplines are too, quality management, all these other things, risk management, are all part of the whole life cycle. So it's not like I can point to a particular place and say, oh, I'm going to do configuration management here. No, I'm doing it literally everywhere all the time. That's where that, again, that, the idea of the model now, it, it takes us to that much bigger picture. It's the data, all that set of data and how I'm going to configuration manage and track all that. Okay, so, so let's get into the tool and how does the tool help me do all this? So let's start with requirements management and document control. That's again, classically where people focus a lot on uh, configuration management. Even in this model-based world that we're supposed to be in today, let's face it, we still generate lots and lots of documents. <laughs> and that's because we have to. It's not like uh, you can put a model uh, on contract yet. Uh, nobody's quite figured out that language and, and getting that by the lawyers. <laughs> so, so let's focus on here. What do we do on baselining requirements, and requirements and documents? So again, uh, the, any tool needs this baselining capability. For Indoslate, uh, we have a simple thing where it's called baseline, right? It's in this more tab uh, here. So as you see the back top, uh, box there. It's the uh, it's the it's the uh, document view of a, of a particular document. This happens to be a, a verification requirements document, and you can see uh, I have a drop down there it shows in, showing the different baselines that's in that switch to. So I can go to a previous baseline and look at it, and it's in a read only state when that happens. Uh, so I, that 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 keeps me from making any changes to the baseline. By the way, you can uh, add and delete baselines now. I'll try to change names and and rename and uh, and delete baselines. I, I really didn't want to do that, but we had so many customers who wanted it. Uh, we went ahead and added that capability to the tool. So if you want to baseline something, you click that more tab. That, that that's the middle box. It shows you the drop down for it and the uh, you see the baseline and then. It, it pops up this little panel at the bottom right at the bottom of the, of the diagrams uh, and and you just type in your baseline name hit create and it's done it sure turns all the orange bars into blue bars uh, which is sort of standard practice I think in the, in the industry and so then now everything in that baseline becomes read only if I go in and change some change what it does now is create a new one right so I have my previous baseline now I have one I can change so now if I go in and change it, it'll change the, the bars from blue to, to, to orange for you. So it's a very easy, very simple process. Um, so baselining isn't actually creating baselines in Indoslate is almost trivial, right? Okay? The hard part is really determining when you want a baseline and what it is you're baselining. Uh, you don't necessarily baseline every document, right? You're going to baseline certain documents, but you don't need to baseline all of them. And so again, you have to figure out what when am I going to put that effort into it or not. So, so you have to determine that criteria. No tool can or should do that for you. That's the systems engineer's job is to, is to figure that out, again, along with your program managers. <clears throat> okay, so another th tool we have within InnoSlate that'll help you do uh, this is Workflow. Now, Workflow does it is sort of a baselining of individual requirements or, again, any other kind of entity. You can set up any entity to have its own status tracking or enumerated attributes so that you could do that. For, so like, let's say you want to track your risks. Uh, you can add those to a test cases, uh, issues, tracking. I mean, we have many different types of tracking you can do uh, with the tool. Uh, so so workflow is, again, a fairly easy thing to set up. Uh, so all you do is you go now, but you do have to have owner privileges for the Innoslate project because this is a, this is in the schema editor. So you go to the schema editor, and then the bottom one is workflow. And again, this is only at the project level. You can't do this organization wide. These are just set up for individual projects because different projects will need different base, different workflows uh, set up for them. So it's, we feel that was important to do it at the project level. 
so once you what you do is once you define what those are that enumerated attribute of your different uh, phases or your different states of of whatever it is you're trying to track then you go ahead and and it'll create this automatically for you once you select you'll select the uh, individual um, enumerated attribute and in this case it's the status attribute for the requirement and there's always an initial state okay and then there's the next state whatever it is draft in review on on and on so so that those are there to uh for you to, to are will be automatic now you will have to add transitions and things like that between other states so you have the ability to go uh, from draft to in review uh, draft to reject it. So again, those are my two options for future states that I might want to be able to add. Um, and then all I have to do is go in and add permissions. Okay, so who is it that can, can make this? Who is it that's going to make the changes, right? And that can be individuals or teams. In this case, I'm showing you my software team has the ability to make the changes, and then it notifies the other people here that a change was made and so they can go do something the notification uh if you're using our cloud version is on email um, some of our uh implementations on some of the uh government clouds don't allow an email server uh so we can't provide it there uh however comment if you are setting up your own enterprise version you can configure it with an with an email server and so it will then email correctly to to the people you want it to email to um, Anyway, so, uh, and last but not least, you can lock it, okay, after that's done. So again, that's the baselining part of it, uh, is the, the locking, okay? So that once you've got that notification, it's gonna lock the, the entity so it can't be changed, except by someone who's an owner. Again, has owner privileges, can unlock uh, in different entities. So again, this is a, just another way to do baselining, but at an individual object level, rather than at the overall document level. Again, what's the hard part? deciding what transitions are needed and when and where and who and all that stuff so the, the mechanism in the in the tool is trivial that's the easy part the hard part for you is deciding what you want to do okay so uh let's move on to model management so you know that's a big topic right now model curation I hear that term used a lot so what so that so the question is what's the model <laughs> okay so so what's a model well again the model of a system is much more than a set of diagrams if, if people think your models are just diagrams that's not sufficient uh, it, it, and this is one of the problems with the current definition of mbse uh, people are very focused on the diagrams diagrams the diagrams and if you think about sysml 1.x is really a diagram framework to a great extent it has many things underneath it but most people use it like a diagram framework and so that's not as helpful as what we're trying to get to we're really trying to get to the data level and so that's that's why we're kind of focusing a little bit more on data driven systems engineering rather than just model based systems engineering so anyway so so if we think about the full model is all the data associated with the system and so that's your entire database that means you have to have ways to you know either copy or export or branch or fork those capabilities, right? So, so we provide that in our managed projects view. So you can go into managed projects and, and literally copy, create a duplicate of the of the database. Um, by the way, that does an automatic export import for you is what it's really doing behind the scenes. So just be aware of that. So you will have options in copy. What do you want to copy? Uh, do you want to copy it with uh, all the comments, for example? Uh, things like that. So, so there's there's some options you have in, in these in the copies, and same thing with the exports. And we have, give you two formats. One is straight XML. Okay, so that has uh, all the anything that's in the XML format, uh, description fields, things like that are, are there. But we have some metadata you can add to it, like you can upload pictures separately. Every object can have a picture associated with it. Uh, we also have artifacts which can have files associated with them. Uh, so, so that's another thing that we, you'd be missing in the XML format. In the .ino format, it includes those. It's a zip format file format. So um, again, that's that people have issues with zip. So, but it is a zip format that's very similar to what uh, 
uh, M Microsoft does now with the, the dot, uh, the docxs and the dot pptxs. Those are zip files actually that have that same kind of information in it. So we we kind of follow that pattern. We think that's best practice. Uh, fairly recently, we added a uh, full branching and forking capability. Uh, and again, branching is where your, your plan is that you're going to do some changes and then you're merging back those changes into the into the main trunk of the of the uh, of the of the model. Um, forking means I'm going to go off and do something different, and I'm not planning to remerge those back in. And, it, and so that's that's the important distinction. Uh, our branching forking right now, uh, we you you have to merge all the changes. You can't merge just some of the changes. Okay, so I know there's always people would say, oh, gee, I'd love to pick and choose the changes. Sorry, at this point in time, we can't do that. It's, that's actually extremely problematic to do. Uh, you could probably corrupt your database if you're not careful doing things like that. So the tool can only save you so much if you, if you don't do something uh, properly. So we, we, we force the full set of changes. Um, you know, by the way, if you decide to export it as part of your baselining, uh, you can archive it that that file as an artifact in Innoslate, okay, and use that then also to capture it to your local file location. Maybe it's on your hard drive, or maybe you're using some kind of cloud storage system, uh, or SharePoint, or whatever else. You can you put, add a link in there for that, and, and either in the description field, or you can create a virtual location for it, um, either either object for it. If you, depends what you prefer to do. Um, anyway, this would help you, um, again, track where things are, because I don't know about you, but I always struggle finding things, even with, even as good as search engines as they have today um, on my hard drive, I struggle with it. And SharePoint is really problematic in that regard, too. So, so a lot of these things that are storage systems are just kind of flat file-ish storage systems, and it's really hard to get what you really need out of them. Uh, so anyway, so this is another way to document your baselines as well, uh, very effectively. Okay, another one in this area is individual diagrams. So let's say I do want to just, I'm, I consider my models my diagrams, because I do care a lot about my diagrams too, of course. And so there's a couple ways in Innoslate we can provide that support for you. Um, particularly one is if you go to the uh, diagrams view, uh, there's, a, there's a button in there for the uh, reports and from that uh, you can get that and that's I guess the middle one there <laughs> looks like I have different image things up here so um, it, it's the middle one I'm talking about right now so so if I'm in diagrams view there's that little the little report button and uh, it's a little hard to see in this in this view but it's a little download button uh, right next to the search bar and, and in there, uh, you can have a docx or a PowerPoint output to it. Uh, and it'll put in the, the diagram image, the name and number and description. And unfortunately, that's all the attributes right now we have available in this. Uh, I, I, I keep looking at that and going, gosh, if, if I could sort it by particular um, different type, uh, then I it probably could, we could add the attributes. Right now, it's just a general capability. And of course, then you can add a file name, but it'll, it'll give you a file name otherwise, by the way, automatically for it. Uh, but, th but this lets you sort and separate and search and, and, and uh, order your, your diagrams that you want to output to that, to that uh, document form. And so th that's a great way to, to do it. Uh, another course, you can download individual reports up above. I, I actually forgot that step, but yeah, it's right there for the individual diagrams. And so those are the different formats right now we have for that. Um, we do have a, a request for uh, a .ino or .xml output for, of a diagram, and at the moment we don't have that capability. That is something we're looking into and seeing if we can do, provide in the future. Um, okay, and then last but not least, uh, no, nothing prevents you from creating an actual document in Documents View. Embed your diagrams there and use that artifact and baseline it there. It will baseline that picture, and it will be a picture. That's what you'll end up with in the document. And so, um, not not a live document like it is in, in in the in the main view, because in a baseline you don't want it to change, right? So we have to substitute 
uh, the live diagram in the in the baseline for, for an actual picture. And so we do that. And so you have that capability in the tool. So I, that's actually my favorite way to be, to uh, to do the baseline of diagrams is I'll create a report basically of these, and then we provide that as an output to Word, and we put it up a little bit in Word, and then give it to deliver it to the customer. And we've done that in project after project um, on our own uh, government projects, and and find that that to be very effective. Okay, so. Uh, I think last but not least, major area we want to look at is how do we support uh, VNV, verification validation. Uh, and here, uh, baselining a concept is something called test cycles. Um, we have different test suites you can define. So if you have different sets of tests you want to put together uh, for maybe different periods, maybe you're doing developmental testing, then you're going to do operational test and evaluation, and then and maybe you're doing deployment testing. You know, you have all these different test sets. You want to work with test suites. Uh, it, within a test suite, we have test cases, um, and so those are the different different steps that go on within it, a test suite. Um, and so, so if you want to, though, very often what you'll do is you'll change some attributes uh, in in something, and then you want to make another run at it, right? And that's a typical thing we do. Uh, and then so th there you there you do a um, new test cycle. And so again, it's in that more tab, very, very similar to baselining a document. I mean, it's, just, it's really if functionally equivalent to it. So, uh, and then of course you have the same kind of box at the bottom that pops up and you just type in the test cycle name and boom, good to go. Uh, again, of course, <laughs> the question is where and when do you do that? Why do you do that? You know, what's your rationale? Those are, those are the things you're looking for as you're going through it. Um, See, I'm trying to think of something else I want to say about that. Oh, so another thing you can do, by the way, if you do run tests and you generate a file all the time, and, and that happens a lot with uh, hardware and software development, you'll end up with an output file, and you want to you want to capture that too as part of the results. You can add a file to a test case, and and then that then you can upload those files as well. And then the baselining will help maintain that process too. So, so again, this is something I think you'll find is uh, very valuable in terms of the concept of CM for BNB. Okay, so I'm going to go into a live demo, and uh, we will we will do a few things, and then I'll make sure I leave plenty of time for questions. Okay, so um, here I've got in the slate up, and let's talk about some of the things we went through. So documents. So I go to a document and let me go to that verification requirements document I used as an example here. So here I am and I, I have multiple baselines already established. So let me go to a previous one. And you notice all the bars are blue. I click on an object, it tells me it's read only, so I can't change it. But I can see all the things about it. I can see the attributes, I can see the relationships. But notice I can't change any of them. They're all right here. <laughs> look at comments so anyway so all that's all that's here for you uh, here's where you can delete the baseline or rename the baseline if you need to uh, for some reason you say well gee I didn't really mean to baseline it that's why people ask for this <laughs> uh, and of course oftentimes I oh I typed in the wrong name I I, I, I forgot what our, our how we we're gonna do that so instead of saying V dot two I want to say uh, something else v dot three about four by four point one or something and I want to rename it I can do that here okay uh, also I can get reports there's a post baseline change report so I can see what changed in between my baselines as well so that's another thing that'll help you uh, see what's how how the changes have been have occurred so if you want to go back to the master one I got to come back up here click in and there it is. So we see now all the bars are orange. When I click on an object, I can now change things. Okay. Very simple. Again, as I said, it's 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 meant to be easy. <laughs> so, okay, so uh the next one was workflow. Let me just go through that again real quickly. So that's the schema editor. Here's workflow. <clears throat> again, here's my different ones. Here's here's an example of risk. And I'm looking at the different transitions. If I say I want to add another transition, 
I could come in here and maybe I can go from open to resolved uh, directly. And maybe that's that's what I want to do. Uh, so if I add that, I just add that here. And then I could then start adding in who do I want to be able to do that to, to do the re resolution and not who to notify. Okay. And if I don't want it, just go over here and exit out. Very simple, very easy to use. Um, let's see what else. That one. Yeah, I think that about that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel it because I didn't really want to make any changes. So I'll just discard the changes. So again, very simple. Um, by the way, the in the in this view, uh, you have to positively save things, uh, or, or it doesn't auto save. So do recognize that. When you're in the schema editor that you do need to uh, do the saving yourself <clears throat> we, we don't want you we don't want you to accidentally save a change you didn't mean want to make okay uh, uh so the next thing we mentioned was the whole um side of managed projects so again i can get the managed projects quickest here through this little switch projects folder up here at the top so these are my quick links to my projects and then i can come down here Here's where I could create a branch directly, by the way. Create a new project, of course, but then manage projects. So let's go look at manage projects. So manage projects is a way to help you sort information. You can you can focus in and, and create folders and then be able to track things better that way. Um, the, the, the features here are an edit, so you can go in and edit metadata about it right here. Um, Here's the copy button is this one that looks like there's two two little pictures together here. Uh, so that's the copy. So that would create a whole new copy of that project. And then I've got the export this project and that would create the, the XML format output. And then of course we've got the .ino and that gives us the ability to do the export to the ino format. And then last but not least, this is the branch of the project. So I could click that and then it, it, I can determine whether I want a branch or a fork from here. And so uh, there's some very interesting features with this. Um, I don't do a lot of work in this in this particular part, so I, I don't want to talk too much more about it. But this is this is part you can start doing some serious version control. Okay, so back to my. Um, what else did I? I think I, that was it on that. So let's go to um, B and V real quickly. Uh, test center. Okay, here's your test center again. You set up your different test suites here as you need to. Uh, once you have that going, you have to set it up. And again, there's a lot you can do with test center. Expect result, actual result, status tracking. Of course, this is the key for that workflow. If I'm going to do this, we apply workflow to this. Um, if again, I want to add I, that file attribute right here. So I actually did that with this particular example. Uh, and that's easy to do in the schema editor. In fact, let me go back to the schema editor briefly and show you that. Um, so we've got that a test case. And you see, I've added that right here. Uh, you can have a resultant link, uh, that could be the URI. Uh, to something so that so maybe you have maybe you already have it stored somewhere else. If you want to do that, you can do that. And then here's that file attribute. And adding attributes is simple. You just add attribute, come here and select which one you want, and it's a file type was the file one. So now of course I don't really want to do it twice, <laughs> so I'll get rid of it. Okay. Start changes, yes. Okay, so uh, back to test center. So again, I mentioned the test cycles. So here that you want to create a new test cycle, you do it here. It'll pop up this thing for you and just add the cycle, or you can go back and look at previous cycles and see what they are. And again, it's in read only. Okay, simple, easy. Hopefully easy to understand, easy to develop. Again, you can delete or rename the test cycle as well. Okay, uh, that was kind of going through quickly uh, some of the program management configuration management features. 
Uh, I think I've used us plenty of time for questions. So Elizabeth, do we have any questions? We do. We have a few questions. If you have not done so, please use the panel on the right to ask us your questions. Our first question is, how can you revert a requirements document to a previous version? Uh, okay, so what I didn't tell you about was important and somehow I forgot it completely. <laughs> so uh, the way we can go back to previous versions of something, uh, of an object. In this case, let me let me go to open the entity view. And this is uh, the artifact that contains the test suite. So test suite's a type of artifact. So it's an artifact class L and I don't know if you can see the class here on the left, but it's his artifact. And um, in there, you can have, you have a history file. And if I need to revert back to a previous version of a, do a document, I can, when I baselined it, I can go hit that revert. That will put it back in the same shape it was before. Okay, so this, this, so you can revert an entire document if you need to. Uh, usually people use this to work at the object level and they're gonna only revert back individual things, but in general, uh, and by the way, that, that'll end up changing the change bar to make it all yellow again or, or individually yellow again if you do that, change the history, so. So thank you actually for asking that question because I completely forgot to add that into the presentation today. <laughs> it's actually one of the most important features. It's, it, it is what is tracking at that object level. Okay, any other questions? Our next question, can people not give permissions to still make comments and create relationships? Oh, not, so, can people not give in permissions, excuse me? Uh, so right now, our permissions allow you to have a reviewer who can make comments only. They cannot create relationships, though. That's that's one thing that we keep talking about. How do we how do we permit that? Because that's a read write kind of feature. So as soon as you give people read write to a database, guess what? They have read write to the whole database. <laughs> so, so that, that, that's a little more problematic, but it is something we're looking into because we recognize the need for that, particularly with cross project relationships. Our next question, can Inneslate track CIs? If so, how? Sure. So uh, usually a CI is a physical object. Most people think of it as a, something physical. So you just go uh, in in any uh, in database view to any asset and identify that asset, and then you you should be able to. Um, uh, I don't know. We have that label here. We don't. Okay. So what you'd want to do is create a label called configuration item, and that way you could then track which ones are your configuration items very quickly. You can build a table. You can uh, uh, in database view as well uh, to, sh to show those items. I, I wish I had a good example to show you, but um, the, um, I'm in database view, that's why I'm here. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, and they, but once you do have what you want, you set up a safe query for it uh, to have your configuration item list, and then you can track status and all the other things you want to do with it uh, in this view. So, Ralph, I hope that answered your question. I know you'll tell me if it didn't. <laughs> yes, he said it answered his question. <laughs> Our next question, I'm a new user. Do you have seed models on your website that have complete projects similar to what you are demonstrating? Absolutely. So in fact, if you go to the organization dashboard level, there's a start guided tour. You click on that, there's three right here. We're, we're about ready to add a fourth. Um, and and in it, then, once you select one you want, like FireSat, you hit Next, and then you can take different parts of it that you want to do the tour on, so you pick those, hit Next again, and it'll go through and start walking you through the tool. I highly recommend taking the full tour. But if you, if you get bored, there's a little X here in the top right, just click that, and what you'll end up is you will actually have a project called Firesat Sample 
and it has many of the things I've just been showing you are right here. So um, take a look at that. And by the way, you know you can move these menus around, things like that. Let's keep somehow messing up my dashboard. <laughs> I don't want it to be. Anyway, okay. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Do you have any other questions? We don't have any more questions at the moment. Um, if anyone has any questions, please, this is a good time to go ahead and um, answer your question. Um, while we're doing that, in the meantime, I would like to make a quick announcement that uh, Inslate is now available through Iron Bank. If you have any questions about that, you can reach it out to us after the webinar. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any other questions, so I'm gonna conclude the questions and answer portion of the webinar. And thank everyone for joining us today. As a reminder, we will be following up with you very soon to send you a link to the recording and the presentation slide deck. We'd also like to invite you to our next webinar, how to verify and validate a system or process. That will be May 26 at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern. So be sure to check your email for the invitation. We'd also like to encourage you to visit our website, check out our books and our blogs, as well as connect with us on social media. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for your attendance, and we hope to see you again at our next webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day.